And oh yeah, and Dane, you can see that it is being suppressed. And also Bacon. Obviously, Dane and Bacon are semantically similar tokens. Hey, I'm Neil, and welcome to a walkthrough of copy suppression, comprehensively understanding and attention head. This is an awesome paper that I helped supervise and just came out of the latest iteration of my maths program. And I'm joined by Callum, Arthur, and Cody, three of my math scholars, who all co-led this paper. Maybe we can go around and give quick intros. Uh, Callum? Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Neil. I spent the last like year or so doing a combination of independent mechanistic interpretability research and also field building. So I've uh, run ML upskilling programs with a focus on AI alignment, uh, such as Arena. And I've also helped out with boot camps run in Boston and Cambridge. Awesome. Cool. Arthur? Hi, uh, I'm Arthur Conmey. I also worked on this paper with Callum and Cody as the primary authors, and I currently work as a research engineer at Google DeepMind, but this paper was done when I was an independent researcher. Cody? Uh, Hi, I'm Cody. I did research with everyone here over the summer at Surrey Mats. We wrote this awesome paper. Now I'm back at the University of Texas at Austin, studying computer science and doing additional part-time back type research. Amazing. To start us off, Callum, do you want to just give us a one-minute TLDR? What is this paper? Why should anyone care? What did we learn? Basically, the TLDR takeaway from this paper is that we've identified this particular attention head in GPT-2 small, uh, head 10.7, and we think we essentially understand the majority of what this head does on the entire distribution. So that's in a general sense rather than a specific sense. You can almost say we comprehensively understand it. Comprehensively understand, we might indeed say that. And yeah, what this head does is this algorithm called copy suppression, which we'll get more into, but essentially involves detecting when a particular token is predicted, and that token also appears earlier in the context, attending back to that token, and suppressing the prediction of that token. And this is a like pretty simple algorithm, and it seems that this head implements this algorithm in like a bunch of different situations. Awesome. So do you want to just walk us through like what copy suppression is, and then we can discuss the story and background of the paper? Awesome, yeah. So probably this diagram is best for motivating copy suppression. Let's take an example sentence like, all's fair in love and war. So it turns out that a model will, by default, do like naive copying and predict that the token that comes after and is actually love. By default, it will predict the sentence, all's fair in love and love, which I think is like pretty funny. What we have discovered this head does, what we are defining as copy suppression, is essentially detecting that the unembedding vector for love is stored in the residual stream, as indicated here, and the attention mechanism of this head basically attends from this particular token where love is predicted back to the previous instance of love in the context window, and then the vector that is moved from this source token, love, to the um, destination token, in this case and, is the negative of the prediction for the love token. And we find that like the main effect of this head is direct. In other words, the output of this head isn't mainly fed into like other heads in the model. It mainly goes directly into computing the final logic, uh, and in particular, pushing down the prediction for the love token. So yeah, this is why we call it copy suppression, because it's like suppressing the prediction of a copied token from earlier in the, in the uh, context. Yeah, just walking through that in a bit more detail, the key thing is that models have earlier components that often do naive copy. So in this case, we've got this all's fair in love and in love and prompt. The model needs to complete it with war, and some earlier head has decided to say love rather than war. I had to fight very hard to stop Callum from calling this paper all's fair in love and love. It was a well-fought battle. We, we um, put the letter and... on post that, so you know, I'll, I'll take that with <laughs> It would be so beautiful, and it would not get accepted. Anyway, so we have these earlier naive components, and these naive components directly write to the output, which is represented by the first love and war in the residual stream on the and token at a like early to middling layer. And then at layer 10, the second last layer, this head has looked at the subspace of the model's residual stream on the and token that directly connects with the output, it just skips all subsequent layers, and it said, okay, let's suppose nothing else happened. What would the model do? Oh, the model would say love, but that's copying, and I hate copying in all of its many forms, so I'm going to go and suppress it. It's kind of wild that this happens. We'll just probably discuss this a bit more later, but this head says, okay, if I was going to predict love, but love occurs earlier in the context, that's really sus. Let's look at love and then let's just suppress whatever I look at. 
This cancels out the love, and then the more sophisticated component that said war, which is not copying, remains, and so the model outputs a war. And everyone is happy. Maybe do you want to walk us through the backstory behind this? Like, why were we looking at this head? Why is any of this interesting? Sounds good. Uh, firstly, yeah, I guess I'll just offer one clarification, which is um, the like all's fair in, in love and love is a nice and motivating example. And maybe later we'll discuss like how we think naive copying might be directly responsible for the formation of this head in the first place. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that there is like specifically naive copying, where there is like one particular attention head, which is moving the prediction from this like original token to the um, to destination token. It could be the case that just like the token that is being predicted also happens to be a token which appears earlier in context. And then you, you still have this, this mechanism that takes place. Maybe just one final thing to emphasize on the high-level thing is just, no one has actually fully explained ahead on the whole distribution before. There's been work that kind of understood most of what heads do, but it wasn't really a focus. Like induction heads, there's been work that made an attempt to look at what neurons did on the whole distribution. There's been lots of work that looks at things on very narrow tasks. But this is the first paper that's really been like, we want to fully understand what this chunk of the model does. And I think the fact that we have, I mean, our results are, are like not perfect and incomplete, but the fact that we have meaningful signs of life on models actually at all form completely meaningful components, it's pretty exciting to me. And I think just not something the previous work had really tried to do. Yeah, that's the primary thing that like I'm excited about with this paper. Um, yeah, and I'll say like to compare this to like induction heads, for instance. It, yeah, this largely depends on how you define induction heads. But if you're defining induction heads in terms of their attention patterns, the you know characteristic induction stripe, where you you input uh, a sequence of random tokens, then you input the repeated sequence of random tokens, and you predictably get the induction head attending back from the second instance of a token to the token after the first instance. If you're defining an induction head in those terms then you're only understanding it in terms of its input behavior. You're not necessarily understanding it in terms of its output behavior. Yeah, like there are some induction heads that just like do perform the like direct pattern of boosting the induction token. But this like isn't always what they do. Often you'll just have like induction heads that write other forms of information into the residual stream. But yeah, what, what we're pretty excited about with this head is that we think we understand both um, its inputs and its outputs. We think we understand like how it forms its attention patterns and also like what it does with the information that it moves once those attention patterns are formed. Yeah, so why did we look at this head? Where did this come from? The head initially came from uh, work done by um, Arthur and others on the uh, indirect object identification circuit. See my previous walkthrough? We won't get too far into the details there, but essentially you have sentences of the form, uh, when Mary and John went to the store, John gave a drink too. In this case, the subject token is John and the indirect object token is Mary. Indirect object identification task is to predict that the token that comes after two basically Mary. So you, um, there are heads which attend from two back to Mary and boost the prediction of Mary uh, to follow two. The very weird thing about this circuit is that although there are heads that do this, we call them name mover heads, there are also negative name mover heads, which systematically attend back to this like correct Mary token in order to suppress the prediction for that token. And this seems like super weird, because in this particular case, this is just actively working against like what the uh, model is intending to do. Because like Mary is the correct answer, um, and John is the incorrect answer. So you're like actively making the model worse by by doing this in this particular case. Just to clarify, these negative heads, it's not that they're just accidentally being unhelpful. It's not that they just like always boost male names, so they happen to boost John or something. If you swap the second, if you make it so it's Mary gave a drink too, it will now suppress John. These heads have like learned to do the task unhelpfully. And it's just like, why does this happen? This is also a pattern that happens in other tasks. Uh, so induction heads, which Callum was mentioning, but I've got a previous walkthrough on as well. Induction heads are heads that detect and continued repeated text. Like you have something like you see the, the model sees the word Neil, and it has no idea what comes next. But if in the previous paragraph it's seen Neil Nanda occur like five times, Nanda now becomes like a pretty good guess for what comes next. This is an example of induction. And these turn out to be a really big deal in the model. What happens is that there's also these things called anti-induction heads, which systematically will look from Neil to previous occurrences of Nanda, and then suppress Nanda. And it's like, what? 
Why do negative heads exist? What on earth is going on? So yeah, to make this clearer, I guess yeah, maybe we'll get into this a little bit more later, or maybe um, maybe like right now. But um, these two things, these like negative heads on the IOI task, which uh, attend to marry and suppress it, and also these negative heads on the induction task, these types of heads were both discovered in the context of their specific tasks, doing this like very specific thing, which seems to be actively unhelpful in the situations where they were studied. And what we're basically doing with this paper is saying both of these concepts, which seem like separate and which seem like they use task specific information, actually might be the same concept, which we're calling copy suppression, because you, you kind of have the same motif in both cases of attending back to a thing which was already predicted in order to suppress it. I think we should walk through that a bit in a bit more detail. Yeah. What is the link between negative name movers and copy suppression? Yeah, I guess the point to start with would be that, um, yeah, the, the main head that we think is the negative head is 10.7. So, um, yeah, you can see that here. There's also 11.10, which um, most of the things we're saying are true for 11.10, but to a lesser degree. Before head 10.7, two name mover heads exist, 9.9 um, .9 and 9.6. So what these two heads do is attend from the two token back to the Mary token and boost the prediction for Mary. So going into head 10.7, the Mary token is already being predicted. And then what this head 10.7 does is detect that the Mary token is being predicted and detect that Mary appears earlier in context. And it is that that forms the attention patterns for this head. You're attending from the prediction of Mary back to the previous instance of Mary. And then the vector that gets moved from the source token Mary to this destination token 2 is essentially the negative of the Mary unembedding. So it's the vector that you add to this position to suppress the prediction for Mary. And this is just analogous to our all fair and love and war case, where you're predicting the love token here, you're attending back to a previous instance of love in order to suppress the love prediction. Here, you're attending from the two token back to Mary in order to suppress Mary. I think it's worth taking a moment to register kind of what exactly the thing that was missed in the previous work was. The naive assumption was you have heads which systematically look at the not-repeated name, Mary, in this case. They clearly seem to have some real knowledge of the task. And indeed, if we look at the name of the heads, they are part of this circuit that seems to make sense. There's earlier things that detect that John is repeated, these duplicate token heads and induction heads. This information is moved to the final token by the S inhibition heads. And then the name mover heads retrieve all non-repeated names. This is like a perfectly coherent, meaningful circuit for doing this task. But then the so-called negative name movers actually know nothing about indirect object identification. They know nothing about name moving. They're not name specialized. They are just blindly suppressing all this copied. And in the context of what happened earlier, they are connecting not to the S inhibition heads, but to the layer 9 name movers and responding to those. And this is just such a wild plot twist. We actually find that the copy suppression heads are exactly the same as the anti-induction heads, which I think we've got a cute graph of in the appendix. Uh, yes, we also have an interactive graph for us. Oh my god, we have an interactive graph. All right, what am I looking at? Too many dots, not enough time. Uh, I'll zoom in, but this is what you meant with the comparison of yeah, induction yes. and cop suppression. Yeah. yeah. So basically, this is a scatter graph of a bunch of different attention heads in a bunch of different models. On the x-axis is how much they perform copy suppression on the IOI task. In other words, how much they attend back to the token Mary and, and suppress it in sentences of the form, John and Mary went to the store, John grew a drink to Mary. And then on the y-axis is the anti-induction score on a sequence of random repeated tokens. Uh, in other words, if you take a random sequence of tokens and then duplicate that sequence, on the second half of that sequence, how much is the model suppressing the token which, if you generalize from the first half of the sequence, should come next? And if you actually zoom out and see the entire graph, you'll see there's like very little pattern in the negative-negative quadrant, and most heads are in the negative-negative quadrant. But negative-negative means they are not copy suppressing and they do induction. That's correct. And, and this is very much like the default behavior. Like most heads are in this quadrant, like weekly. But if you specifically look at the positive positive quadrant, the ones which are suppressing the Mary token and the ones which are suppressing the previous instance of a token in induction um, data sets, 
you can see this like really strong positive correlation, which like very much suggests that, um, barring a few um, like exceptions, the the motif of copy suppression in IOI datasets and the motif of anti-induction are one and the same. Um, and you can see right here in the corner is our head 10.7 in GPT too small, which is the um, like a very strong instance of copy suppression in both cases. And yeah, I guess a few notable things about this graph. Um, the first is lots of models have copy suppression heads. There's lots of different colored dots. The second is we kind of got lucky with 10.7. It's unusually copy suppression -y. I don't think this means our results are like deeply cherry picked, but it does mean that you should maybe be a little bit like, well, eh, this probably generalizes a bit, but not a ton. And yeah, note also that the x-axis is copy suppression score, which we'll define in part two, but is a bit more involved rather than just a negative name moving score. So yeah, curious, what was the decision to pivot this from a negative heads of fun paper to a let us explain this head across the whole distribution? So I think the the first piece of evidence that we saw that made us think that this would be a good idea to do was when we started looking at the weight matrices of these particular heads. So, you know, one hypothesis, if you'd only seen the um, results of the IOI data set, is that this phenomena is, say, like specific to names or, um, you know, specific to like certain subtasks which involve like grammatical information and, um, you know, like, uh, like proper nouns or something. Yeah, the piece of evidence we saw that suggested this was not the case was when we looked at what we're calling like, um, and I guess to, to also follow the um, terminology and mathematical framework for transformer circuits, the full weight matrices um, of head 10.7. So yeah, you have two different types of full weight matrices. I think I'll actually just open the relevant page on the stream list. In essence, what we were doing by looking at the sort of full weight matrices of, of like this particular head was trying to figure out whether it is a general phenomena across like most words in the vocabulary that this head will pair up the unembedding on the destination token side with an embedding on the source token side in order to attend from one to the other, and whether it will move the embedding of a particular token to the negative of the unembedding. We basically found during our analysis, which we'll get more into in the next section of this talk, that by and large this was the case, um, and much more so than for any other head in, uh, in basically duty too small. On this question of like, why do we explain a single head? rather than just zoom into neg heads. I, I feel like maybe it's the time now to discuss like the table of copy suppression examples to just show that it really does occur across the distribution. Yeah, I was um, thinking looking more into like OWT and stuff. For my take on like why it's a reasonable thing to do to zoom into just explaining one single attention head across like the whole distribution was just the experience of like actually looking at just like samples from the data set of where this particular head was being particularly helpful to reduce loss so what we did was we sampled examples where this head was like in its top 5% of most useful cases. So it was not like the most extreme cases possible, but it was cases where this head was like genuinely useful. And we looked at what was going on here. I just want to highlight like exactly what you did there, because I think it's actually kind of instructive. So the first thing is just this head is helpful. There are a bunch of times when copying is incorrect. Suppressing copying is useful. And this head actually on net improves model performance. Do you remember how much it worsened loss by when you deleted it? It was kind of like each head has a very, very small effect on its own. I would say in the like the one E minus two of loss, I think, but I can't remember. Yeah, it was, it was around that. I think it was it was point zero one one, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the, the the key thing, and maybe we'll get a bit more into this, is like um this is a very like copy suppression is a very specific and very concrete algorithm. There are certain cases where it is very, very helpful, and these are illustrated in this table. There are also certain cases where it is very, very unhelpful because it is suppressing the token which is exactly correct. And these almost balance out, but the head is like net helpful overall, which you know you would hope because otherwise, what the <laughs> hell is the point? You had a really nice graph at one point. I don't know if it made it into the paper with the model's calibration curve. Do you still uh, have that? Yeah, not not the, not the literal calibration curve. We have the the rough idea. Maybe it'd be worth getting to this at a later point because um, I think this this is more linked to high level ideas of like why we think this head exists in the first place. Fair enough. All right. In that case, the second thing I wanted to call out from what Arthur was saying is that this idea of taking the most helpful or most damaging dataset examples is like I think a pretty important one. This is analogous to what we often do with neurons where we run the model on like a billion tokens of text. And then we look at the prompts where the neuron fired the most. 
and look for patterns in those. And often this can let you identify the new, what the neuron does, if there's a clear interpretable pattern. You're dealing with an enormous soup of data. The ability to convert things to just a number and maximize over that number is really useful. And attention heads don't have a number in the same way, but you can often just come up with kind of janky functions. And here, I think it was basically just deletes the head, look at the change in ability to predict the next token compared to not deleting the head and look for the biggest delta. Yeah, so specifically, you can read more about or listen to more about this stuff in maybe the IOI walkthrough, but we use the mean ablation, which is a somewhat common uh, like method in mechanistic interpretability, where we replaced the like output of this attention head 10.7 with its like average output over like all cases where this head is used. And then this like allows you to see where it's like really harmful to just like remove this head. And so we collected like three examples uh, sampled from like the top 5% of cases in the table. And this was sort of like, at least to me, like the light bulb moment that this head was like really well explained just by this one copy suppression algorithm. So just to maybe to step through the first example from the table, and then maybe I'll leave the rest uh, to like uh, the viewer, that we have a sentence such as millions of Adobe users picked easy to guess, and then like the next word needs to be predicted. And by default, before layer 10, uh, the model thinks the correct answer is Adobe here. So the model thinks the sentence goes, millions of Adobe users picked easy to guess Adobe, which clearly sounds incorrect. Though uh, it's a naive copying case, of Adobe from earlier in the prompt. So here we're not really saying anything different to what Callum discussed with the all's fair in love and love example, but it's just worth noting that this is like really like the literal training data of this model, which is the so-called open web text data set. And so uh, this just continually occurs when you look at the training data of this model and the cases where this head is actually helpful. So in this case, the correct completion is actually passwords, i.e. millions of Adobe users picked easy to guess passwords, which is much more plausible completion and is actually what the like, data set uh, has as the completion. And uh, the layer 10 head seven, our head we comprehensively understood is super helpful here because guessing Adobe is incorrect. So it reduces loss by getting rid of the wrong answer analogously to the all's fair and love and love case that Callum discussed. I think it's like worth here like reiterating the point because like we we're kind of hammering in like the quality between these heads and like anti-induction that like these examples here do not like these are not induction but given the fact that all the head is doing is like observing like upstream predictions of the word adobe for example and seeing adobe in the prep in the past context it is doing copy suppression which also allows it to do like anti-induction and so the idea of like this head is both copy suppression and anti-induction is just due to the property that like, that like Anti-induction is just a subset of copy suppression, which is like the more general phenomena. Yeah, you, you you could view induction as like one particular instance where you might want to copy. Okay. Uh, also, yeah, one thing that's maybe worth mentioning on this table, um, since we're talking about this in the also in the context of you know people doing similar things for neurons and looking at which data set examples are like most activate a particular neuron. One criticism of this kind of work is the interpretability illusion where you might overinterpret exactly what a particular neuron is doing because you think you see some common theme in all of the sentences that like maximally activate it. But then like when you look at a different data set, you see a completely different theme um, and there's like no consistency. One of the reasons that we were able to get around this is because rather than just taking like the top 10 examples where this like had affected the loss most, we actually um, you know sampled from the top 5%. Um, and even in a very large data set, we still found that sampling from the top 5% um, gave what looked like very um, uh, results that systematically looked like these, in essence. These particular cases are definitely not cherry-picked. Um, and to like prove that, we also have an interactive page where you can look through a bunch of open web text prompt, and um, you can like highlight the ones where this head affects the loss most. And you can see that in like the vast majority of these cases, you have something going on that's like pretty similar to this. Yeah, we probably could walk through an example, but like, uh, yeah, I don't know whether this is like worth doing in this video. You can always provide a link. Why top five percent? I mean, this also holds up for like various um, like numbers around like you know one to five percent. Um, once you get past ten percent, it's like a little bit less so because this kind of algorithm like fires in very specific situations, like situations where you are strongly predicting something that also appears in context. And this doesn't happen like all that frequently. It, yeah, it turns out that when you when you get to like past five percent, not only have you explained like most of this head's effect on loss overall. Because like if you do an integral of all of the, like the way in which this head affects loss over the top five percent of examples, then you've like explained most of the way this head affects loss overall. 
And yeah, then if you go past that, not only are you not getting much more marginal um, explanation of like how this head is affecting loss, but also the examples stop looking like copy suppression. It just looks like, oh, this head is like boringly attending to the, the boss token or something. Like this is another reason why maybe the um, we should expect that the interpretability illusion is a bit less of an issue here, because we're not just looking at an activation of a neuron, which is like, you know, we don't know what that neuron is actually going to be used for. We're looking for um, like something which we're measuring from an endpoint. We're looking at how it actually affects the loss. We're not just looking at, I don't know, the, the magnitude of the vector of the head output or something. And yeah, just to kind of elaborate a bit on exactly what the concern we're trying to avoid here is. Well, I have some issues with the interpretability illusion paper, but the kind of core concern is that you have a big distribution and there's something wrong and the tail of the distribution is really unrepresentative of the main thing. Like, you've got a neuron that activates on frogs and apples, but apples activates at a mean of four, frogs activates at a mean of two, and you look at the mean, and you look at the max activity examples, and they're entirely apples, because apples have a mean of four. And so you're like, cool, it's an apple detecting neuron. And clearly this would be bad. The specific concern about you might notice a different thing when you use a different data set came from the paper using like fairly narrow data sets, which isn't a concern here because we're using the whole pre-training distribution. The right way to think about it, in my opinion, is that you kind of want to try to capture most of what matters about a neuron. Like if the neuron is normally at zero and occasionally at four, and every time it's at four, it's about frogs, but sometimes it's at point one when it's about apples. I'm kind of comfortable saying, yep, it's a frog's neural. When it's a four is the only thing I care about. So one way you can think about it is like, how much of the expected value for the neuron's activation is explained by the different categories that things fall into? And given that the change to loss is pretty heavy tailed here, taking just the top 5% represents like most of the effect of the head on the model's loss. And effect on the model's loss is like kind of the examples weighted by how much they matter. And so if basically all of these are copy suppression, we can be pretty confident that like, yep, this is most of what it's doing. Maybe we should pivot a bit to discussing like why copy suppression is like a surprising thing to find in a model and why we think this actually happens. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to like flag real quickly that like the idea of like taking the top five percent of like loss reducing activations and whatnot, and like the fact that we were able to like consistently see copy suppression every single time is, I think, like kind of lucky. A lot of other heads are like probably semantic, and if like you were tried, if you would like repeat the same thing, it you may not get like the same clean results of like, oh, I can identify a single clean like algorithm behind every single example. And I think that like we did get a bit lucky here with ten by seven that like it was just copy suppression. Yeah, it's also worth noting that this is a more common thing to find, I think, when we're dealing with later heads rather than earlier heads, um, because earlier heads will like often be doing pretty fundamental things like, you know, they'll be attending to the previous token or they'll be like storing information that's valuable in a bunch of different circumstances. When we're dealing with heads later in the model, there's really not much computation left to be done. So often they will be like, OK, in this particular situation, I will change the output this way. And in most situations, I like won't do anything. You wouldn't necessarily get this in um, like, you know, if you're studying earlier heads. And yeah, so that's like why it's very heavy tails in this particular case. Yeah, I find that when doing research, things often feel a bit like what I call getting lucky. Like sometimes you look for a circuit and it's just like three heads matter. Sometimes you look for a circuit and it's like every layer matters a little bit and it's incredibly diffuse and it's terrible. And we don't really have a good understanding of why different ones happen. As Cody says, it's kind of the norm that heads are polysemantic. Heads are kind of cursed. Heads do many things. And you guys kind of got a bit lucky here that, yep, this head just does one thing. We can understand that, and it is glorious. It would not have surprised me if it just does a bunch of other stuff too. So one intuition I have for why copy suppression in particular wants to specialize is if you look at some of the polysemantic heads we found, they do lots of behavior that, like, involves looking at special tokens in different contexts. Like name movers are, look at the name of the indirect object in IOI. They also look at the name of a person when converting a name to a Twitter handle and a bunch of stuff like that. But the OV circuit, the bit of the head, which is like 
once I figured out what I'm looking at, what do I do with it? It's just copying. And copying is a very straightforward thing that lots of tasks share. While here, copy suppression is look at the copied thing and then anti-copy it or suppress it. And this is a much rarer thing that I think is not that useful across tasks. And I found that like many heads do copying with their OV and a small handful of heads do anti-copying. That's one guess for why it's monosemantic and why we got lucky. It's rare that anti-copying is the like first order right thing to do. If this was the main head that like actually affected the output, then yeah, it's very rare that it's the right thing to do. Because like most of the time you want to copy rather than copy suppress. But as I guess we're like about to get into now, one of the things that we think this head might be responsible for is like responding to predictions that are being made by earlier heads in the model and kind of calibrating them. And this is like useful in a wide range of circumstances. It doesn't have to be a task specific behavior. Yeah, so pivoting a bit to just discussing copy suppression as a phenomena, one thing that I find kind of wild about it is that copy suppression is a function applied to the unembedding space of the model. So naively, when a bit of the model decides what it should output, like an induction head sees Neil Nanda, the current token is Neil, and it decides to output Nanda. This is written to part of the residual stream that is going to get mapped directly to the logits. And naively, I kind of thought of this bit of the model as, yep, that's just where it writes the stuff once it's figured out what goes there. Things just add directly onto the outputs. And once it's written there, it's kind of done. It's like write-only access. And copy suppression to me is like surprising because it's post-processing on this space. The model is taking its existing answers and its existing best guess and saying, mm, I know that in general I copy too much, Let's refine this by suppressing the copying. I think this is kind of wet. In some forthcoming work with Wes Gani, we'll hopefully have a bunch of other examples of model doing this kind of suppression or boosting on the output space. Yeah, yeah, th this does seem like pretty wild. And it was like one of the main reasons why our priors were that this kind of thing wouldn't extend across the entire data set. But it does! It does. I know, it's amazing. I think there are like two kind of different frameworks I have for this, and maybe this, maybe they're like relatively similar in some ways. Um, the like you know the, the sort of blurred lines between them. Yeah. So bro broadly speaking, I think like the two different ways that you could um like expect this kind of behavior to be robustly useful. Number one, it is useful for later heads to do this kind of behavior because they get to see everything that comes before them. One picture that you might have is take a, a head like uh, nine point nine, which does the um you know name moving in the IOI task. It's very easy for that head to just like identify what it thinks is the correct answer and then like push for it. And if it just pushes for it um, without, you know, like self-regulating, without without like you know controlling precisely the amount by which it like the, the amount it like pushes the logics by, it essentially doesn't need to worry about um, oh, what if this like head in the same layer, 9.6, also pushes like a huge amount and I'm like super overconfident. The advantage of having a head that's like later than all of these name mover heads doing this. Is because this name of head 10.7 gets to see all of the predictions that have been made by all of the earlier parts of the model. It, it gets to see like all of that context, and then it can essentially adjust the confidence level so that it is um, like at the right amount um, based on you know all of these predictions that have been made earlier. Yeah, and, and then I think a kind of different but very related concept is a specific idea of overconfidence. Cross entropy really penalizes being confidently wrong. Take the naive algorithm where an attention head like always detects when a model is predicting one particular token with like 10 more logits than any other token in the vocabulary. And it detects these situations, and then it reduces the logit on that like super confidently predicted token by one. This algorithm is like strictly good, because in the cases where the confidently predicted token is correct, the way that softmax works, you're still going to get like virtually zero loss, because they're still predicting this with like complete certainty. But in the cases where this super confidently predicted token is wrong, by subtracting logits from that very confidently predicted token, you are essentially adding directly onto the log probs of like every other token in the vocabulary. Because it's that confident prediction that like sets the zero point for um for log probs, essentially. Yeah, so, so th this is like one very simple example. Uh, and you could imagine that this head is doing something similar by like detecting situations in which a token is being predicted with like way more confidence than it should ever reasonably be predicted. And then, like, attending back to it in context uh, in order to suppress that prediction, basically. And yeah, one one piece of evidence we have for this is this, like, kind of conceptually cute experiment on calibration curves. 
essentially we we came up with this like metric based on um calibration curves and like um integrals for figuring out how overconfident a model is um like you know if a model is always predicting like you know 90% confidence when it's actually only getting only when it's only right to like 80% of the time this is an overconfident model and by ablating each of the attention heads and seeing how this overconfidence metric changes we can detect which heads are responsible for making the model more overconfident and making the model less overconfident and we essentially see that this head 10.7 is really really strongly responsible for making the model way less overconfident in other words it like brings the overconfidence level down from like very high to like much closer to um to like perfect calibration essentially it is an epistemically healthy head oh actually no it's not even this graph this graph so like it it's um <laughs> yeah N not only does it decrease overconfidence more than any other head it like actually changes overconfidence like about more than three times more than any other heads in like either direction which is like pretty striking it's beautiful i had no idea this section existed which appendix oh. number is this it is appendix d d entropy and calibration d. yeah entropy is like also a related um results calibration like naively you might think that the purpose of every component in a transformer is decreasing entropy because it should be concentrating probability mass in the few tokens which are actually correct or likely to be correct. And so you can measure each head's contribution to the um, entropy. And surprise, surprise, you find that head 10.7 is one of the very few heads that is increasing entropy. Increasing entropy in this sense is like synonymous with, or it may be synonymous with, decreasing overconfidence. And yeah, yeah, again, like it's um, but yeah, this is the graph where you can see this head is like really increasing entropy relative to the average head, which like tends to be decreasing entropy. Yeah, I, I guess like also one distinction here. There's a question about whether increasing entropy is like canonically the best way to think about what this head is doing, or whether copy suppression is the best way to think about what this head is doing. And increasing entropy is just like a byproduct of that. I lean more on the side of the second one. I think this is like a sort of interesting conceptual experiment, but it's not necessarily like describing exactly at the core like what this head is doing. I think it's more likely this is just like a byproduct of the specific copy suppression algorithm. If it was a general entropy decreasing head, it would suppress highly confident things that are not copied, which does not happen. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So yeah, maybe to round off this section, we can discuss guesses for why copy suppression forms. I think to me, this whole thing is just kind of surprising and still a bit of an open mystery to me because this is an entire head. It's like 1% of the model's attention capacity. This is super expensive. Why does the model not just not copy in the first place? Or just take all the copying heads and lower their output weights by like 10% or something? What is the role of copy suppression? I, I mean, I, I guess part of our like previous discussion does sort of answer some of the ways that I, at least I'm thinking about this. In the like, you know, you have this idea of this head being able to like see all the outputs of previous heads, and it's easier for this head to regulate their outputs than for like these heads to each guess how much each other is going to affect the like residual stream prediction of a particular token, and then like self-regulate in, in some like according way. Yeah, there, there are a few like more specific suggestions we have for like why this head forms in the first place. Um, because also like why the head forms in the first place, and you know what it's doing to reduce the loss in the like fully trained model are like you know two two different questions. Uh, and it might be the case that the reason that it forms in the first place is like some much more boring pedestrian um, explanation. Like, I don't know, maybe it literally is just as simple as naive copying. Maybe the model, like very, yeah, this is one of the theories that we batted around a lot um, earlier in the, in the project. Like maybe naive copying is a useful thing for the model to learn like pretty early on because most words in the English language, or, like, you know, most tokens they're going to encounter in GPT's vocabulary, if they appear once in a sentence, you probably expect them to appear later on in that uh, sentence or later on in that prompt with higher than base root probability. You, we might call that like um, the positive update property or something. And yeah, we claim that like most words have this property. So one algorithm that a model might learn early on is naive copying, where you just like attend back to these words and like boost their probabilities. This is a useful algorithm in general, but it can like go too far. It can be applied in situations where it's like not super helpful. And this is where the negative heads possibly come in, and they can um, essentially like attend back to these tokens in si uh, specifically in situations where like knife copying is maybe pretty bad, and um, and like suppress this prediction. K kind of in Mechanter, there's a distinction between studying the model as a eventual final organism that just all fits together, and being like, what is the role of each component in this overall algorithm? But 
models are formed via gradient descent or weird variants like Adam. It's a kind of continuous step-by-step -step process. And you can also ask the question, why was it useful for gradient descent to incentivize the formation of this? And it's pretty plausible to me that models are full of weird vestigial organs that made sense at some point in training, aren't important anymore, but the models just kind of adapted around them because that was more efficient than unlearning them. One story is that copy suppression exists because the model first learned naive copying, and then it was easier to learn copy suppression than to unlearn naive copying. And now it just lives with both. Other guesses, uh, as Callum was saying about calibration and entropy, one interpretation you could have is that if one naive copier says something and nothing else says that, it wants to be kind of loud and proud. While if five naive copiers say something, then they're like, well, we don't want to like over update on this. We want to kind of tone it down a bit. And none of them in isolation can do this because if you just tone them all down by 10%, that achieves the right thing when all five fire, but it's sad when just one fires. While copy suppression can kind of wait till the end, aggregate it all and be like, great, you were too confident, let's downgrade you. Mechanistically, this would be because the amount of copy suppression is mediated by the amount of attention paid to the copied token. And this comes from the softmax. And softmax isn't just a linear thing that takes the amount of copying and just always decreases it by 10% or something. It's a weird function. And maybe like another take on why um, this might happen that's maybe slightly indirect, but like explains previous observations is that it sure seems that the way that models are like outputs are computed is iterative in the sense that like uh, you can just like stop transformer models after some number of layers and then immediately jump to like the unembedding matrix. And there was like a less wrong post from a long time ago called um, the Logit Lens, which popularized this observation. But it's subsequently been written about in like several papers, um, which we reviewed in our work. So this is an empirical observation that if you uh, just jump to the end of a transformer's predictions from like halfway through the network, it is not like complete garbage, but kind of like naive and simple completions that kind of make sense, but they're not as good as like the whole model's predictions. So if you just like buy into this is the way that these models work, that they iteratively refine their predictions, then copy suppression is like nowhere near as surprising as it's maybe been discussed so far, because you need to figure out what exactly your earlier naive dumb predictions were, and then like deal with that crap. And like, this is what our like head does in some ways. So it's maybe an indirect way. It doesn't explain why this logit lens observation is true, but uh, if you believe that logit lens stuff, then this copy suppression uh, like algorithm is like not not as surprising. And it's cool that we got some like mechanistic evidence that models can like refine their predictions essentially. Because we'll go into that in like deep more detail later. But uh, you can actually look at the weight matrices to see how this head responds to like earlier predictions. Also, to throw in last uh, one last one for free, if we're talking about um, like mechanistic stuff. Yeah, again, as I think we'll get more into in the second section, the part of the model of this particular head's like mechanism that we understand least is the queries. So it turns out that although the unembedding on the query side is like a very important component for determining the overall attention, and it like it definitely has like a lot of explaining power. And this is reinforced when you look at the um, you know, you browse open web text examples, you like see how much each token is being predicted at a point where you're like going into head 10.7. It is not the only factor that matters on the query side. There's like some other random crap that is pretty important in determining like exactly which situations copy suppression turns on during. And it's very possible that like that's where the complex circuitry is like really contained. Like um, there could be more complicated logic behind exactly when it is good to copy suppress and like when it is bad to copy suppress that like maybe we haven't like fully picked up on. A uh, third kind of more esoteric hypothesis would be that like we like feel pretty confident that GPT small was trained with dropouts, and we will talk about this later. But head ten point seven is like pretty helpful in self repairing the earlier name movers, and so like one argument for like maybe why this is useful is that due to dropout, uh, it's more useful for like the model to like disperse its functionality across multiple heads as opposed to like it being limited to like just one head because like dropout if it like kicks out a head now the head can't do like both induction or copy expression. Whereas like now if it's like spread across multiple heads and like they like self repair each other, then like the head can have lower losses across a wider range of examples. Yeah, we'll be discussing this more in section three.
yeah, maybe this is a good segue to briefly discuss, like, from a more zoomed out perspective, the implications of copy suppression and why this is useful for things like automatically discovering circuits. I think there's two key things that make automatically finding circuits or just doing causal interventions on a model hard. Negative components and backup components, uh, also known as self-repair or the Hydra effect. Negative components are things that negatively contribute to the model's performance on some task. This is a problem because uh, if you're trying to, I don't know, see, say, I can delete everything in the model apart from these five heads and I get 90% of the performance, this looks really impressive until you've realized that some of the heads you deleted were like actually suppressing model performance by like minus 50%. And so you've actually gotten like lost 60, but gained 50 for a net of 10. And so your results are all kind of garbage. I think copy suppression is exciting because it's a detailed, fairly well understood case study of one kind of negative component. I don't think it's all of it. Like, I think that there's a bunch of MLP layers, which are often negative, and we don't really understand how they work stuff that isn't just suppressing copied things, but it does seem like plausibly a big chunk of the picture of what's up with negative stuff. And there's also this kind of wild link to self-repair, which maybe you want to t briefly talk us through, Cody, and we'll get into more in section three. Yeah, so maybe first, what is self-repair? Yeah, so self-repair is this idea that was first like highlighted in the IOI paper then there is like this paper called the Hydra Effect that was recently released that described this phenomenon self-repair, which essentially, if you ablate components of a model, this is like deleting heads or like removing them. If you ablate components in the model, the model seemingly compensates for this within the same four tests. And this is like pretty unintuitive, uh, especially for heads that aren't trained with like dropouts. Copy suppression here is like a concrete example where we can actually understand like self-repair. This being like, if you ablate the mover heads, which like do the native copying, then the copy suppression head won't need to copy suppress. So here we have an example of copy suppression, I mean, self-repair, and the fact that ablating the copying will also simultaneously ablate the copy suppression. And thus you have like no change in loss by ablating the name mover heads, even though the name mover heads like contribute to like the final answer. Yeah, just to walk through that in a bit more detail. Uh, let's take the all spare and love and love example. And let's say there's some naive copier that output outputs plus five logit to love. And then the copy suppressor head is like, ooh, I hate love. Let's suppress this and outputs minus two for love. So it's on net plus three. If you delete the naive copier, this removes the plus five, but it also removes the minus two because there's nothing to copy suppress. So the net change to the logits is like removing plus three or minus three. But the direct effect, not mediated by any downstream layer, is plus five. So the like total change in the logits when you got rid of a head is undercounting its direct effect on the output because there's these subsequent filtering and post-processing steps that get kind of baked in. It's unclear how to think of this. Is this the copy suppression head deliberately backing up the earlier thing? Or was the plus five an illusion? And really, we should have thought about it as plus three this whole time. But yeah, and self-repair is kind of a massive pain in the ass if you want to figure out what different bits of model mean. You try deleting a head, which actually does matter a lot, but then the model self-repairs, later bits compensate, and it looks like it did basically nothing. This means that your numbers can be wildly misleading. Like, Cody, I think you found some heads where the compensation was, like, 0.96 of the direct effect of the heads? Or yeah, something like, insane? In, in practice, especially in the IOI case scenario, like, you get ridiculous amounts of software pair. I think there was even one model where I found one head, which, like, originally was a name mover head, but if you deleted it, like, the backup kind of, like, contributed more to the correct answer than, like, the removal of the correct head did. And so, it's, like, can be a pretty big problem for like automatic circuit discovery in like very narrow case studies. And we'll talk more about this later. So that sounds like something where calling it the Hydra effect would actually be justified. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yes, none of this cutting off attention layers and seeing layers go back nonsense. All right, I think that's probably everything in part one. Unless there's any final bits? I guess one thing we could briefly touch on is, um, which I think you, you mentioned, but then we didn't go into as much detail about it as maybe uh, the relationship between copy suppression and circuit discovery tools like ACDC. Um, I'm guessing Arthur will have like much more uh, nuanced takes than me on this. I'm, I'm happy to give like, I mean, my, yeah, I, I give my like rough overall sense, which is I think this is interesting because it potentially presents some kind of type signature between like components which are doing a task specific thing and components which are responding to previous predictions. You know, if you apply a circuit discovery tool to something like AC, uh, something like the IOI task, you'll discover the heads which are doing task specific things, and you'll also discover these negative heads, which we don't think are doing task specific things. But like maybe there is scope to refine tools like ACDC so that it only picks up on the things which are like task specific, and then it puts the things which are more like you know doing something general rather than specific into like a separate bucket somehow. I think like ideas like this seem pretty interesting. But yeah, as I say, Arthur will probably have like more nuance takes than me on this. Yeah, I guess the key, the crucial observation to me is similar to the one Neil mentioned about how to factor like negative heads into automatic approaches to find like circuits. And this is, I think, the actual lesson you learn here is that it seems likely that models like often just generate negative components to react to earlier things they've done rather than like do completely different heuristics, like that, like it go like doing a different task, essentially, and confounding your analysis. So one of the like um, primary hypotheses we had after the IOI paper was that these heads were doing some like literally different tasks. They thought that like for some reason they were supposed to be doing like heavy copying of like the John name three times. But this just seems false. Like uh, they're just like doing their own like thing, which is reactive to the like copying statistic. They're not doing something smarter where like the actual answer is John. And so I think that this is like broadly like a uh, like positive like some some like positivity for like more like circuit discovery work because it doesn't feel like we're getting confounded by like a million different algorithms when we do this narrow work. It feels like we just need to be aware of the fact that like there can be like adaptive model components that respond to the existing things done. So uh, I became more optimistic about that approach like after this work, but it was a useful case of like doing this sort of mechanistic work to figure out what's going on to then sort of like hopefully inform future work there. And yeah, maybe one closing thought is, I think a pretty cool takeaway from all this is somehow on the benefits of like narrow task specific circuit analysis, there's a kind of tension between doing work that tries to understand what a model means in general, like this head is an induction head and nothing but an induction head, or this neuron will only ever fire on German text no matter what. And work that takes a narrow task like indirect object identification and tries to study in detail what the components are and how they fit together. Some people have criticized the narrow work for kind of being a bit too niche and specific. And I think this work is like a pretty interesting story of taking some weird anomalies that came up in narrow work that was like way faster and more tractable than trying to do this on the whole distribution would have been. And then turns out that those anomalies actually had this beautiful structure that occurs on the whole distribution underlying them. And I think it shows that both approaches can learn from each other. Uh, Credits to Arthur to making this point clear to me. But yeah, shall we move on to part two? How we know we've actually fully, uh, well, mostly understood ahead.